And welcome, guys. Thank you. We have a special edition today. I've got joined with my brand new good friend, Roger Wakefield, YouTube fame, master plumber from Texas. Roger, how the heck are you doing today, buddy? Oh, we seem to be having a problem with our audio. Isn't that interesting? Roger, can you hear me, buddy? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. A uh, bit of a slow start, but that's okay. Um, guys, we are here today because uh, we are committed to helping you here at Home Renovision to be the best renovator DIYer you can be. And so we figured we're going to bring on some experts into our channel. Roger is an expert. Uh, Roger, am I right in saying that you're a master plumber? I am a master plumber in Texas. Not just a master plumber. I've got every master endorsement. So med gas, residential fire protection, water supply protection specialist, every bit of it. That whole mess. My goodness. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, if you're just joining us now, here's the deal. We are going to be taking Q&A for most of the session today. All right. Roger and I are not going to talk about what it's like to be YouTubers. We're going to be talking about plumbing. We're going to be answering your questions. So the chat is open to the entire community tonight. Woo, let's all behave. And um, we've got 1,400 moderators <laughs> standing by. Um, just wanted to say, guys, if you've got questions, then then feel free to ask them, okay? But if you want a question answered for sure, then just do a super chat. That way you'll get our attention and we'll be able to make sure that we can answer your question. I know plumbing is one of those things, right? It's like when 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 Neil Armstrong came back from being on the moon, they asked him, hey, what's it like to do something so important for humanity? And just being in that little space capsule, realize that plumbing was important, is what Neil said. And uh, let's just face it, the we don't have enough tradesmen nowadays. So as a homeowner, you're forced to do things yourself. We're here to help you. I've done some plumbing stuff on my channel. I'm kind of, I can make water go downhill and I can bring water to a fixture, but... Uh, today we want to talk to some experts, handle some questions that maybe are outside of my understanding, or let's face it, I'm from Canada, Rogers from the United States. We have different building codes, different, um, different scenarios and different plumbing materials. Even, uh, Roger, what are you, what are you guys using down in Texas for plumbing water supply? Is it copper or CPVC or what are you up to? We, we don't use a lot of CPVC, mainly as copper. And okay. it, we're starting to get into PEX. And I say mm. starting to, in just the last few years, PEX has become more popular. I remember one of the first service calls I went out and did where I was rerouting a line over from, I was moving a kitchen sinks when I was done. Mm. Whenever it chipped up the floor, dug everything up, and I got down to the water lines and there were PEX. And I, was, I had everything there in copper ready to go. So it was like, oh, this is different. <laughs> Uh, but I'd been doing commercial work for years, so I wasn't even used to it, but I figured it all out, made it happen, and it, it's still working today. There you go. Okay, so you're from Texas, so you got a lot of slab on grade, mm -hmm. which is great because that's not my experience. Listen, today is not about um, me versus Roger. This is about bringing all of my expertise from a four-season climate with basements and all of Roger's expertise of being in a, a southern climate with slab on grade him from a licensed professional and me from a renovation contractor who hired professionals somewhere in the midst of all of our knowledge. If there's a question that can go unanswered today, it would be a miracle. I'm just being honest with you. All right. Now, um, the way this is going to work today is really simple. I got Eric back in Ottawa because I'm in Florida. I got Roger in Texas. The three of us are all working as a team to make this happen. Eric is going to take questions and put them up on the screen, and Roger and I are going to answer them. But we've also got a few questions that came in because we did a community post. For those folks who are members who couldn't make the chat today, I know it's Tuesday at 5, right? Like not everybody's able to jump on, so that's all right. Now, let's just say I want to handle this one right out of the gate. Garbage disposals. You bet. Do you do those a lot? Where you are in Texas? Oh, almost every house in Texas has a garbage disposal. That blows my mind because where we are in Canada, we kind of frown on the idea of putting garbage in our plumbing system because it just slows everything down. So, Jeff, so, do you see this cooler right here behind me? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a garbage disposal mounted in the bottom of it <laughs> because we figured out how to make a redneck margarita machine. Okay. So you right. Know, some of sometimes we have them in the offices too, not just at home. Nice, nice. Well, real quick, I got a, I got you know, Stu is here in the chat here, and he wants to know: Do you prefer PEX to sweating pipes? I, you know, I personally don't. I, I love copper, but then again, I'm an old school plumber. I started plumbing in 1980. I plumbed with copper for many, many years, soldering, brazing. Mm. Here lately, you know, pro press push to connect. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it, but there are some that work better than others. I'm just, I'm old school. I love copper, but PEX is starting to become more prevalent everywhere. Mm -hmm. I like the expansion PEX because it does not reduce the flow. If you put together a crimp fitting where you push it inside the pipe, it restricts the flow. And I've, I've had problems with that. So unless so you're going to upsize it, I love copper. That's an interesting question because we had somebody in the um, in our community post actually ask. So, what is the best way to run PEX if you're going to run it? Do you use a manifold or do you use a three quarter line and then and branch off to half inch to each of your fixtures? I'd love to get your take on this. I think that if you're going to run PEX, I think you're good as long as you upsize it. Upsize at mm. one full size. If it calls for if your code book calls for a three quarter inch supply line run one inch because then your fittings are going to be about three quarter inch ID. Mm -hmm. That's going to keep you from losing any flow where it comes to be a problem is people running a water line. Say your water heaters at the back of the house, water comes in the front. So yep. you've stopped at multiple fixtures, getting to your water heater. Now you've got multiple fittings and branches or, or manifolds or whatever coming back to your shower. Yep. Maybe a manifold <clears throat> is good in that point. I would still upsize it because of the flow restriction. That's interesting. So let me ask you about flow restriction then real mm -hmm. quick, because when I'm plumbing a shower and I'm using PEX, mm -hmm. I don't worry about the PEX and the interior diameter of the, of the fitting and crimping because our showers have got so much restriction in the water flow already for water conservation that it doesn't seem to have a negative effect. Do you, do you have a different opinion or do you have a different system down where you're living? I think it, again, it probably depends for a manifold system, you're probably not going to have any problem at all. Mm. But if you take that three-quarter line and you go through 20 or 30 different fittings that are restricting the flow, you may not have a problem if the shower is the only thing you're running, Jeff. But if the washing machine is running, the dishwasher is yes. running, right. and your kids are in the shower too, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you may be the very end of the line. It's like, wait, where's all my water at? Right, you're just standing there with a dripping faucet on your head. I get it. Running in circles trying to catch the water drops, yes. So at the end of the day, it's not about perfect scenario. I'm the only person in the house using water. It's about what if there's one, two, or three things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Yep. Fantastic. My friend, look at this. Um, how, how You got much experience tracing water leaks, figuring out where the water comes into the house? Oh, that, that's our specialty. We, Is it really? Oh, yeah. Slab leaks and leak detection. Because on here, we're slab on grade, like we talked yeah. about. And I like what you said. This is not Jeff versus Roger. Look, there. I, I love DIY. I started my channel to teach people how to fix their own plumbing. Because to me, look, every plumber can't get to every problem. And right. I would rather a homeowner at least know how to fix it. Whether they call me another plumber or do it themselves, I want them to at least know what all's going on, why it's so expensive, or why maybe they can do it themselves. We are going to jump back to that in just a second. Okay, I'm just following the chat. No, no, no you're good. So, so yes, All right. yeah, slab I get leaks, it. leak detection are big for us. We're slab on grade. Huge. Yes, big deal. And and generally, if you're slab on grade and you got water at your floor and not in your ceiling, it's coming from underneath. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> now, listen, we got a, a super chat here from Yinzer House. This is one of our regular members, and they're from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the question is, it's got a 150-year-old house. Copper was put in during the 50s. If he replaces with all pecs, can he just follow the original lines, new schematic needed, question mark? And I think, generally speaking, because this particular member is doing a complete overhaul in an old house, <laughs> I like your advice. Listen, just run three quarter or maybe one inch, maybe a one inch feed line as, as far as you can. And then then branch off to the individuals because you, it takes less. If you run a manifold, you got to run thousands of feet of pecs. Yes. 
But if you just run a one inch supply line and run three quarter to the bathroom and then half to each fixture off of that, then generally speaking, you're, you're reducing your risk of not having enough volume. And that's really the issue, isn't it? Yeah, you're, you're not affecting pressure at all. Pressure right. is going to be the same no matter what size you run it. Yeah, I, I love that. You're supplying the volume to where even if there are multiple fixtures open, you're never going to have a problem. And that kind of advice only holds true depending on the size of the water supply to the house. Mm -hmm. What is the standard water supply size to the house down where you're from? Three, three quarter inch. It's yeah. three quarter inch yard service is normal. Yep. Okay. The, meter, the meters are five eighths or three quarters, somewhere around in there. So mm -hmm. that'll work perfect. So going to three quarters is just a great start and use that as a main branch. Think of it like a HVAC system where you got a three quarter running the whole length of the house and every fixture is running a half inch off that. Or a three quarter off that to a room would be even more ideal mm -hmm. because then you're going to a bathroom and you're not going to have a shower and a toilet and a sink operating at the same time. But you can't, you can't, you can't have, there's no downside to having more volume of water available. So if you're concerned about it at all, just upsize your pipe. It's pennies of glass. And like I say, when you're DIY and you're plumbing, you're making money every damn foot you're putting in. All right. <laughs> Jeff, think about this. It's not going to cost you that much more to go from three quarter to one inch. You're, you're buying the pipe anyway to replace it. It's yep. going to cost you pennies to upsize it. Do it. You're, you're going to enjoy it much more for a lot longer time. I love it. I love it. My goodness. So how much galvanized or shall we say cast iron do you have in Texas? Okay. Cast iron, we've got a ton of. We used to have galvanized because the before copper, they ran the water lines and galvanized. Right. Now, it's all corroded. It's full. I mean, we've gone into houses that I'm surprised by looking at the pipe. Water ever even went through it. <laughs> but for the drain lines, cast iron, we've got, we've got under all the houses. That's part of why I'm wanting to build a training center to teach plumbers how to not just use a camera, but use test balls and hoses to get in and isolate the system to find out where problems are exactly at. A lot of plumbers are just walking in saying, we need to replace everything. And what we mm. do here with the house's slab on grade, Jeff, we've got black clay here. We literally dig tunnels and go in and just replace everything. Isn't that something, eh? It's a trip. Wow. See, well, like when I'm renovating an old house, and I love it. That's why I moved to Ottawa, because we have houses built uh, turn of the century, like the 19th, not the 20th. And... <laughs> They were all built with uh, granite foundation. And in Southern Ontario, where I'm from, they were all built with limestone foundation. So the houses themselves were deteriorating at the foundation point and causing all kinds of decay. But when I go to Ottawa, all the houses were just standing like they were built yesterday. But yeah, they had all these steel pipes, all the galvanized, all of the, all of the, uh, all the problems that go with it. And it was amazing when you pull out an inch and a quarter drain line, that's a hundred years old. And there's just a pinhole for the water to go down. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you've got to replace that. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is though, if you can get a camera in there and show people now, you, now they know why. Well, and... yeah, I get it. I did a video and I actually cut the pipes out of a lady's house and I just put the pipe into the camera and said, see that this is why you have to upgrade your plumbing Yes, because all that time ago, A, we didn't have building code, and B, we had, hey, it's a pipe. Water moves down it. That's all we know, and that was the end of the science. Today, we know that we have corrosion issues. We've got sediment issues. We've got calcification issues. We've got all kinds of things growing in there, um, and the world has changed. I'm just going to go into the chat here now, Roger. Oh, here's a good question. AD electronic teardowns. Now, that, this gentleman changes his handle on a regular basis, but I know his picture, and he's quite insightful. How much CPVC do you see fail, and what environment slash why it fails? Down you here, don't see a lot of that, do you? No. The, about the only place that we use CPVC is coming off of a water heater. If okay. We, we can run the TMP line CPVC. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Now, when you, get out, time, eh? mm -hmm. when you get out into the country, a lot of times, if you find an older house that maybe the homeowner has done their own work, they mm -hmm. may do the hot water lines and CPVC, but, you know, I never see a lot of failure in CPVC on a water heater like that. 
So this is fascinating for me because I'm down here in Florida and for the first time in my life, we have CPVC. Like I've never had it, never seen it. It was always copper or PEX. Like we build in Ontario, Canada with PEX exclusively for a long time now. Like it's been over a decade. Okay. But Jeff, you're working on a trailer, correct? Yeah. So I'm down here doing a trailer refit, refit my butt. I'm actually gutting it and rebuilding it. <laughs> I've, I've done it. We're filming a new series guys. Okay. It's going to start coming out in about a month or so, but I bought a double wide trailer and I'm renovating it all interior and exterior, bringing it brand new. It's from 1984. And we're going to make a brand new inside outside. We're expanding the living space outside and I'm on a $20,000 budget. And I'm going to show you how much you can do with DIY. I'm telling you right now, um, you can double the value of your, of your home doing DIY. And we're going to prove it to you in the series, but we have CBPC down here. And it's like, this is some good quality plumbing. I mean, you've got a primer, you've got a solvent. There's just no reason why that should fail. And as long as you got all your joints supported, there's no reason CPVC should fail over time. I think that's a fair comment. No, and, and I think it's right. And even now, I one of the big leak detection jobs I got was for a trailer park community. Some of these communities have three, 400 homes, and they would have me come in at night. They knew that they were losing water. They didn't know where. So I would crawl under all these trailers, single wide, double wide, whatever it is, the middle of the night because you don't want anybody running water. So mm. I'd come in at 10 o'clock at night to about 6.37 in the morning, crawl <sighs> under. Now, imagine what kind of critters are hanging out under these trailers. That's not the time to be under a trailer. <laughs> no, it's not. But but you can't do it during the day when people are you doing laundry and running dishes. and all yeah, kinds oh, of yeah. stuff going on. Oh, eh? yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've climbed under there and seen bigger eyeballs than mine and crawled right back out. It's like, you know, I'll what? tell you right now. Yeah. When I got this house, I wanted to do an inspection under the trailer. I moved a couple of the bricks and I put my head under there after I put my flashlight in. I was paranoid because it's like, you know, down here they have a saying in Florida, it's a, a red and yellow killer fella. Mm-hmm. You actually got poisonous snakes down here. <laughs> it's like freaked me out, right? Like where I'm from, if it's poisonous, it rattles first. But down here, no, it's a stealth attack. Anyway, <laughs> I stuck my head under there and took a quick look around long enough to realize that this trailer had been in position so long that the kind of grass that grows here in Florida, it had raised the elevation of the earth about eight inches from what it was originally. <laughs> and there was no way I was getting my belly through that yeah. hole to go inspect anything. So I had a good look and I was like, okay, that's it. Enough for me. The place looks pretty solid. And uh, yeah, that was, that was the end of that. Now, listen, I got a question for you, Roger, because you we got a community here of DIYers. And one of the comments that we get all the time is, and I know this changes from district to district or state to state, or um, can homeowners pull permits to do work in Texas? Yes, they can. Matter of fact, if a homeowner and... In Texas, you can do any work on your house, any plumbing work. Now, electrical HVAC may be a little bit different, but any plumbing work you're allowed to do if this is your homestead, if you've got it registered with, with the tax office, this is not just a home I own. I live here. This is my mm. residence. Yep. You've got that listed. You're allowed to do anything a plumber can do, anything. Work on your gas line, work on your water line, work on your sewer line, change any fixtures, any appliances, including a water heater. Okay. But you have to pull a permit just like a plumber does. Sure. The inspector's going to come out. He's going to inspect it. He's going to give you a green tag if you did things right. He's mm -hmm. going to give you a red tag if you did things wrong. And normally he'll be nice enough to tell you how to fix it. But you that's know, how it is. Inspectors are our friends, right? They are. Like, especially as a homeowner. I've never had a scenario where an inspector came out and said, you did this wrong and I'm not telling you what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, you figure it out. <laughs> right? Yes, I'm going to give go, you a red tag. You figure out pro why. And I, yes. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. That's not how they operate. Um, especially nowadays when we're short on trades, more mm -hmm. and more homeowners are pulling their own permit. And I think, like, for instance, down here in Florida, things are different. Where I am from in Ontario, um, there's a lot more leniency when it comes to working in your own house. But, and we have a rule here. If you don't have to move a P trap, you don't need a permit because now you're venting and drain and everything is still in, 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 it's still in the same condition as it was before. So if you have to move your drain 
after the peach trap a little bit. There are products on the on the on the comp, you know, products out there now for custom showers where you can take the 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 drain after the peach trap and redirect it to a different location in your shower, build up, add a curb, do a custom walk-in. All this kind of stuff exists. But there's no permit for that because you go, you had a shower drain or a tub drain, you're doing a shower or a tub. Florida's cool with that. It's like, but every state is different. Yes, they are. At the end of the day, there's no way I can make 52 videos on how to build the same shower. So guys, if you're watching and you want to do plumbing, contact your local building office and find out what the rules and regs are. Because getting information on on internet or websites might be very convoluted and might be yesterday because they could have voted a new policy for a city tomorrow and every county has got its own rules. It's absolutely amazing. So um, at the end of the day, we're going to do the best we can to show you how to do stuff, but it's up to you to figure out if you're allowed to do stuff. And even down here in the United States, Jeff, you've got the UPC, the Uniform Plumbing Code. You've got the IPC, the International Plumbing Code. Right. And you've got to know which code your city, state, or jurisdiction, wherever you live in, what they're going by. But not only the codes, you've also got to check with each city and find out what addendums they have made. What I love that word, addendum. That's just like secretly trying to do you in. Yeah, I know. Oh, my kingdom for a world where you could just fix your house and nobody gives a rip. But that doesn't happen. Not to say that people don't. But, you know, if you want to sell your house, um, depending on this, the condition of the market, you know, following codes, having permits, having inspections, these are very, very important things. Mm-hmm. Two years ago, you could have sold your house if you did it yourself from A to B, wired it, plumbed it, did your own structural engineering. No one would have given a rip. They would have given you cash on the spot. They would have just bought it up, scooped it. It's available. I'm buying it. It's pretty. But the market has changed in a heartbeat. And now if you're going to go buy a house and you don't have your permits in place and you've got new work, they're going to check it out. They're going to take their sweet time. They're going to do their due diligence and they're going to go, I'm not buying your house because you broke the rules. And so, you know, this is a lesson to be out there. If you're going to do DIY, do it yourself, but do it on a permit. Here's what I like about that, Jeff. We deal with a lot of houses where somebody who has done a flip, You know, people are buying houses, flipping them right and left these days. We'll get called by a real estate agent. Hey, I've got a buyer. They want an inspection. They want a plumber to come look at it, do a sewer water test, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And we'll walk through and I think these flippers are doing the work themselves. They're not even putting a P-trap in, coming out, nining straight (laughs) back into the wall. And I just tell the people, man, be glad you called a plumber because a lot of people don't catch this. I've had home inspectors not even catch that. And it's like, you know, man, if you're going to do something, do it right. Get it permitted. If you're buying a house, make sure that the work was done and permitted correctly. It really is a big deal. Yeah. If you're going to look at buying a house that's been flipped already, um, don't get wowed by the new car smell. Okay. It's called off gases. That doesn't mean that everything is done right. Um, uh, Stu has got a question here. He goes, at what height inside the walls to run plumbing lines? I'm assuming you mean horizontally. And now, Roger, is there a code or is there a standard or do plumbers just say, hey, here's best practice mm-hmm. for running horizontal water lines in, let's say, a bathroom? Because I've got my own take on this. I'd love say, to hear yours. Say, say we want to put an air chamber, a shock arrest or anything like that above it. Normally, we'll come out, run the water lines, say, at maybe 12 inches, 90 up, st- put a T out, stub mm-hmm. up. That way you can put an air chamber above it. Yep. Now they're, nowadays they're saying, like, the air chambers really don't work. Eventually the water will get up there. But, you know, that's the way that I was taught. Right. And PEX is different than copper. So, like, you know, I've had plumbers tell me that we don't even need air chambers with PEX because it expands. I'm like, eh, that might be a little bit hokey, but who knows? <laughs> well, and, and, I mean, if you run soft copper, it'll expand a little bit, depending on how much pressure you've got. So well, yeah. And, <laughs> hopefully you, know, you don't have that much pressure. So I had an experience, Roger, you're going to love this. I had a plumber uh, working on a project who went horizontally at around 34 inches from the sink to the toilet. Okay. And wouldn't you know, we were, we mounted a wall mounted sink. So Friday, 
the sink was mounted mm -hmm. and there was no metal plate put on that stud. Mistake number one. And so, and this is not my, I was not managing that project. I just happened to be around when this happened. <laughs> okay. It's the clarity. It's Monday morning, we come back to the project and somewhere in the neighborhood of about a thousand gallons of water had worked its way through that house. And this was on the third floor of a three story, three unit renovation. So every ceiling, every floor, every interior wall, had to be gutted and ripped out and we started from scratch because of a six cent screw went through a water line that didn't have a 10 cent plate. Mm. Ouch. Yeah, that, that's a, that, that's a painful one. Uh, some things you learn the hard way. <laughs> that's a yeah. painful one. So I love the 12 inch rule because nobody's mounting anything at 12 inches. I, I love it. And, and that's part of my reason why I literally love to come over, get over, go up to where I want to go and say I'm running, say I bring my water line up behind a lavatory and I'm mm. not looping it up behind the toilet, behind the tub. I can come up under that lavatory, tee across at 12 inches, come up. I can yep. tee out for the lavatory and still go up, get an air chamber if I want it. Now I can run my line over to the toilet. If it's a cold line, yep. drop down to come out at four, four and a half inches, Boom. six inches, wherever I want. Go I over, like six. continue up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give yourself I like up enough, six. Depending on Never what kind have of a problem toilet. with the baseboard. I hate yeah. cutting baseboards around toilet lines. Oh, Absol goodness. absolutely. Oh. Uh, and and these days too, know what kind of toilet you're putting in. We actually went out to do a video the other day installing a new toilet. Hmm. It was a toto, and the back of the toilet came further back than normal and actually had a curvature on it. I've had this problem. Yeah, and your water lines in the way, so we didn't actually get to install it because. It was just a toilet install yeah. video, and I didn't want to tear open the wall just to do a no. video. <laughs> Be careful when you purchase a toilet. If it if it costs more than your car, <laughs> then and they do, then, some of them can and, these and days. Some of them do, and you might want to take a look at the specs for your rough in, mm -hmm. the same way we do specs for the rough in for a gas supply line for a stove, because these gas stoves have got a cavity for the supply line and the shutoff valve built into the back of the stove, these toilets, you got to have your water supply specific to the toilet, some of them. And they're a real pain in the butt. So check for clearance, take a look at pictures, look at it in a showroom. Um, but yeah, I know it's frustrating. So these, everybody wants to make a toilet sexy. There's nothing sexy about a toilet. Uh, now, Can I, I just say? I, I, I don't know, Jeff, I got to be honest with you. I've got a bidet toilet seat on mine. <laughs> And that warm seat and that warm water, it, it, it's kind of sexy sometimes. I just got to tell you. Uh, fair enough. And listen, I'm just saying, uh, the best toilet that I've got on the market, I get for 150 bucks. Okay. It's comfort height and it's soft clothes and it looks like a toilet. Yeah. But I never have a problem installing it and it's never, ever clogged because it's got the largest trap size in the industry and it has an instant siphon when you flush. Love that. So why would, would you, why, why, why? Like, why do we break from that? You know, like, why are there 8,000 different models of toilets out there? I don't have any idea. And, and worse uh, than that, now, why is there a thousand different ways to install them? You, you know, they, yeah. they've got the holes on the side where you've got to reach in. There's, there's a mechanical. Those stupid traps, those slimline toilets, and they've got plastic bet. parts and little knobs. And yeah, it's just insane. Let me tell you something. Um, the. The Toto toilets, they do have this right. They have a whole trap system with with like an expandable um, diaphragm for when the toilet gets set into it. It's guaranteed waterproof and you yeah. never have a leak. I love that. I could talk toilets with you all day. My God. Ben White says, how should I troubleshoot a slow flushing toilet? Right there. You, you know, first of all, Raise your flapper, reach inside, pull it up all the way. See, does it flush very clearly, mm. very quickly like it should if your flapper is not even there? Okay. That's if a great, great piece of advice right there. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to start because now you know you're getting full flow. It could be your fill valve not filling with enough water. Mm -hmm. So look at your water level. Has it come lower and lower and lower? Maybe the fill valve or maybe the flush valve needs to be adjusted. Maybe the fill valve needs to be adjusted. Take the flapper up on the flush valve, mm -hmm. let it completely drain your tank, and watch your bowl. Does it go down like it should? 
there could be a slight clog in there. The holes on the bottom side of your ring, they could be clogged. There's different ways to clean those out. How old is the toilet? Calcium and magnesium builds up in that ring under the seat, just like it does everywhere else water comes out. There you go. Here's another thing. I got some personal advice. Um, in a lot of places where people have done remodeling and they've mm -hmm. added layers to their floor, they've added flange kits, right, to extend the flange. And they've done stupid things. And they did it themselves and they bought a double size wax ring and then they put the toilet in, they set it down and they squeezed it over to the right or something. And they've got all that wax sitting there. So now you've got this beautiful three inch hole that's half covered in wax. So if you lift the flapper and you give that, that structure the maximum capacity and it's still not working, pull the toilet. Cause I'll guarantee you there's something wrong with what's going on underneath nine out of 10 problems we've had with, Toilets and leaks and problems is the assembly it has nothing to do with the toilet. It's all of the in between stuff. That, that's why I say start pulling the flapper. That gives you full yeah. flush. But also, we've seen kids flush things down in toilets that get stuck. <laughs> Just gonna <laughs> throw that out there. You need a camera, yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah, you know it's funny because if you if you pull the flapper and then you've pulled the toilet and everything seems normal, then you got to get a camera in your line because there's something jammed in there and it might be like he-man or something i mean who knows <laughs> right <laughs> stretch armstrong oh my goodness right all right here we go uh mark mathis has got a question for you well, you got a wax ring or rubber slash silicone for a toilet what what do you what is your preference you, you know mark this is a great question I, i'm old school uh like i said i started plumbing in 1980 i still use wax rings I'm kind of like Jeff. I'm not a big fan of the double thick one. <laughs> you know, somebody comes in and adds three layers of tile and, and now you've got to do something. Yeah. Uh, the, the rubber kind they're they have a good story and people say, look, they really don't leak. I'm just, I'm old school. I'm used to wax. I don't, you know, they say the big problem with wax. Well, then you got to clean it up. Okay. You know, I clean up after myself every time I do a job anyway. That mm -hmm. really doesn't bother me. I know it doesn't leak. As long as the toilet's not wobbling at all, I'm never going to have a problem with it. Yeah, so here's here's my experience with this. If you have uh, a foundation of a house that's, that's not moving around on you, mm -hmm. then wax is great. Um, in my experience with older homes, with foundations that are subject to frost and heave, and things twist and move and crawl spaces, up in the northern climates, uh, the rubber ring actually makes sense because it'll expand and contract as the building moves. <laughs> Isn't that the craziest? I love but, that. And, and I've never thought about it, Jeff. That That's a good thing to think about. Even up here, and we don't have a lot of pier and beam houses, but there's some. Hmm. Most of our houses are slab on grade, so they never move. So I do. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. Yeah, there's uh, there's something to learn from different situations, eh? Mm -hmm. Um Demorin, is it possible for two ceiling vent fans from two separate bathrooms right next to each other? Okay. Able to effectively work through one vent on the roof. Trying to avoid a second vent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get this question a lot, Roger. We got two bathrooms. They're trying to basically run two lines and then a splitter and then share one gooseneck exhaust or something off the roof, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. Do you get involved with that as a plumber? Is that your expertise? Normally, no. Normally, that is an HVAC guy. They're going to come in and put in the dryer vent normally and yep. the fart fan vents. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we call them down here, brother. That's what you call them, man. You Love bet. It. it is what that's it is. A, it's but, a little but, style. <laughs> but, but my thought is, you know, you, you get a bird up here building a bird nest in it. Now you turn on the fart fan over here. Yep. Your neighbor may be enjoying the the value of your work so, so this is the thing right so i've got this personal experience in in renovations we don't call hvac guys to run ducting for fans it's generally the same schlep who's doing all the carpentry the drywall the subflooring right these are the guys doing it and so what we found is people they, they sell a, 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 um, a like a ty four inch galvanized pipe fitting at the home depot all right and the problem with that is is then is then connected to something else that's usually 
corrugated that's bending and, and, and it's got a gooseneck and a neck and a 90 and a 90. It creates a backdraft. And so you've got the fart vent from one room emptying into the other room at like 10 or 20 percent capacity. And so you're now not just farts, but you're sharing humidity from one shower room to the next room. And you're not exhausting that humidity unless you've got a fan that's got a humidistat and that costs a few bucks. So consider the idea that if you're going to do something like that, you better have the integrity to install your own damper valve systems as well. All right. Um, for me, one more protrusion through the roof doesn't mean a hill of beans. If it's done right, it's going to work. You've already got one. So you're, you're not, you're not flooding your house already. Just, separate the darn thing and then have some some confidence that your installation is going to work because i haven't seen a ty damper valve system on the market and that's just me if i'm wrong hit the comments up and let me know where you can buy one but i don't see them around okay michael ellis has got a 1940 house in mid-michigan 1940 uh, five years before anybody cared about how we built anything. <laughs> That's just great. How far can I run a drain line for a toilet? Want to add a second bath on the first floor, about 30 feet from the planned spot to existing stack. What we're dealing with here is rise versus run, my friend. What are the rules? Well, 30 feet. How much, how much room do you have to get your fall? Can you get at least an eighth of an inch of fall? Are you trying to run a four inch line or a three inch line? If I'm running a line that far for a toilet, I'd rather have a full four inch line. I yeah, don't like treat it like under a slab, eh? You, yeah. you bet. You bet. Yeah. And just make sure you can get your quarter inch of fall. You're going to vent it down towards the end. So you're not going to have any problem there, or at least I hope you are. Uh, but yeah, you shouldn't have any problem running 30 feet. If there's another place that you can tie on to and get to your main quicker dropping down another wall closer to it that may save you from tearing out a lot of ceiling that's kind of up to you and the installation i guess wow that's interesting so what are the rules for you guys if you're running a horizontal line you need a quarter inch for every four feet you know you need to run at least an eighth of an inch per foot okay eighth, eighth of an inch fall per, per feet per so, foot yes that's where you guys are doing okay mm -hmm. at Good. least and that's I try your, to go cool. your is that the IB? Is that the American? Uh, that's the uniform. Uniform, uniform building code? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Because we have like so many building codes. And and the funny thing is, is, you know, you can you can run a slope. And if you're in your head and you're DIY and you're thinking, well, if it's if it's just a quarter inch, I, I, I go to half inch. That's better, right? No, the answer is no. Because then the Not water always. leaves faster than your poop. Yeah. Right? Then your affluent gets caught and it clogs the drain. That's a fancy word for poop. You know. Yeah. I love it. And so then you run into problems where you're going to end up like, like um, solids and and uh, toilet paper. Yes, so building up in your soft lines. stoppages. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Huge issues. Um, I love it. Okay. So uh, Patrick says he's looking into install a Santa Flow. Do you have Santa Flow down where you are in Texas? Not a lot. Not really? A lot. Eh? Yep. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, we use a lot here because we have below grade housing. And so mm -hmm. it's a problem solver for a lot of situations. Uh, I'm looking to install a Santa flow with a need for a two way vent. Where is the best place to tie in or do I give it its own vent outside of the house? So first of all, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Patrick, every Santa flow system that goes in the house needs to be tied into fresh air venting. If you have a single macerator, you can tie into existed venting, but you've got to follow the rule of 10. And that is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, but if you've got a three inch pipe and a two inch pipe and a one and a half and a one and a half and a one and a half, you tile it, tile it, tile it all up. And if it's more than 10, you've got too many things drawing on a vent. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So in a lot of cases, these Santa flow systems require their own venting because you're already going into a bathroom with a three and a one and a half and a two. And if it's a double macerator vent, that unit actually in the literature says you need to have your own one and a half inch vent line dedicated to the unit. So when in doubt with questions like this, feel free to contact Santa flow. They are more than happy. They're the manufacturer. And I tell people, if you got a question about a product, call the manufacturer. They'll help you out. Like you don't rely on third-party information about something like plumbing. It's too bloody important. 
You don't want something backing up and flooding your house. It goes, oh, but the guy on Reddit said that's just the wrong place for advice, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Listen, Santa Flow is invested in making your success as well because they want you to say, hey, it worked. This was a great product. And, I, and they're going to answer your email. So get in touch with them and double check. And, and the good thing is they've, they've tested their product in every situation. They're going to know, hey, this works great or, hey, you right? can't do this. And, yeah. yeah, like you said, they want it to work. They don't want to install something and say, oh, no, just put one in. You'll be fine. You put yep. it in, it never works. You're going to be writing negative reviews every day the rest of your life. Right. Like there's a very thin line between something being successful and failing. <laughs> <laughs> My father once told me a story about he went hunting for rabbit and he was on a rabbit trail and he had a shotgun and he was looking down the trail and he saw this rabbit come zipping down the trail and had it in his sights and he followed it and went boom and he pulled the trigger right between his feet. And the difference between losing his toes or not was an eighth of an inch. <laughs> now he got the rabbit, but if you apply that same thing to plumbing, it really is applicable because it'll work right up to the point where it doesn't. Yes. Right. And that's the thing. So Louis says, I have a chlorination on my well cap to treat the algae problem in your well. Does chlorine affect PEX, PVC, CBPVC? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Chlorine affects everything. It, it, it's just the easiest way to say it, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, it really does. We, we, uh, you know, it, it affects even, it even affects copper. They say that's yep. part of the problem that leads to the slab leaks. There's impurities in the copper. Chlorine eats away impurities. So even a yep. little speck of sand in there, the chlorine's constantly trying to eat it away. Yep. Once it does, now there's a pit in there. Now it's eating the pit away. Now it leads to a hole. And, you know, it's funny because I was actually watching your, um, your video the other day about, you know, the, the slab leaks. And it was fascinating to think about, I think it's so easy for us to think of copper as a um, solution, as a metal. It's like, but it's more of a mixture. If you can think of it scientifically, that there are different components in that lining and copper is just the color that we see visually with our eyes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can run into problems in a real hurry, man. Oh man. Like nothing is pure. Like you can buy gold jewelry, but is it really gold or is it kind of gold, right? And, and you know, you know just <laughs> talking about that, the, the impurities, normally a plumber buys copper in like a 60 foot roll. Yep. Well, what if there's impurities like every five, eight, 12 feet, something like that? You tunnel under somebody's house to fix one spot. Mm. Now you get called back two years later and eight feet away, there's another spot. And they're like, look, I spent 20 grand last time. Yeah. I understand, but but now there's another leak. So when I'm a plumber coming in to talk to someone about a, a slab on grade, a leak, it's like, look, this is an opportunity here. Do you want to go ahead and look at replacing everything? Because I can't tell you you're not going to run into this again next week, next month, next year. Yeah. It, yep. it could happen. You have to look at a copper leak as the early warning marking <laughs> of a significant problem. The same that we would look at cast plumbing nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, with drains, roots. I mean, show me a house that has cast plumbing that's near a tree that isn't always clogged. We already know the problem. And so you need to replace it. Now that we've identified what happens with the tree roots and how cast plumbing works, we got to fix that. If you have a slab leak, the expectation that that was the only problem in that copper that's been there for 40 years. It's that's like saying I had one tooth that rotted out, you know, no, all your teeth are rotting out. You had this one came out first. Yes. All right. This, this is, this is what we're talking about. And I tell people this, when you're buying a house and it gets older, consider updating the entire system before you invest on interior finishes, because these things have a half-life. They've only got an expectation. If, I love the 50 year rule. If it's more than 50 years old and it's still there, chances are it won't be working next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Right? Yeah. Don't bank on flipping a house that's 50 years old with new new fixtures, finishes, and flooring because the minute you put it on the market, your plumbing is going to leak. I'm telling you right now, that's just the way that's 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 the way that works. I, I used to always pick pitch that to real estate agents, Jeff. They're 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 coming in, they're remodeling a house, getting ready to sell it. 
Then they call me in later and say, hey, w- w- we think there's a leak on the sewer. Yeah. They've already put down new hardwood floors, All the new money landscaping spent. outside, new Dumb. cabinets inside. Yep. yep. And I test it and it's like, y'all have got three different leaks under here. Which one do you want me to fix first? Wow. Why didn't wow. you start there, guys? You see, this is the thing. When you have a 50-year product, you've got to stop and go, okay. Like, let's say you got a 50-year-old car. All right. You don't just need new tires. Right. <laughs> like, it's not the way it works. You, you, houses get old. The systems fail. Mm-hmm. The engineers are engineering for a 50-year cycle. That's their plan. They do their math based on a 50-year success rate. After that, everything you get for free is just, that's a blessing. <laughs> so if you're going to buy something and fix it up, that's more than 50 or close to 50 years old, and you're not changing out those systems, all you're doing is investing in a property that's not going to get a return on investment. If investors could, could, could wake up to this reality, that a house that's 50 years old with new paint and new flooring is still a house that's 50 years old. Because none of that means nothing when you're when your interior systems fail. Because you're busting out all your walls, you're ripping up all your floors. You got to start back from your mechanical. You got to get your electrical, your plumbing, and your HVAC updated before you put a single dollar into that house. And that's what the value of the house should reflect on the market. And I think we still fail in that just because we have such a a huge desire to have homes sold, and we need a new house, and there's a, there's a shortage in the marketplace. Blah blah blah. Some of these older houses are being sold at hundred thousand dollars more than they're worth, but that's just my opinion. I'm just saying because I know what it costs to <laughs> fix stuff, <laughs> and it ain't cheap. Uh, it ain't cheap, man. Even if you DIY that stuff, I mean, a hundred thousand dollar retrofit on all your mechanical is still going to cost you thirty to thirty five thousand bucks on material, and you know you're going to be buying a bunch of tools you didn't even know existed to do it yourself. So that is a that's a whole world of hurt you're probably going to end up buying some professional help. Quick question before we go to Gotham here. What can a homeowner successfully accomplish in your own mind as a plumber versus when should they call for help? That's a million dollar question that's hard to answer. I get it. It's it's really not. Everybody's got to know their own skill level. How mechanically inclined are they? How Mm. good are they working with tools? And, you know, can they pivot? Meaning, hey, I was going to run it this way, and and I'm looking at at Gotham's question there. So that made me think about it. You know, I mean, Jeff, you can probably do more than my mother could do. So if my mother called and said, hey, Roger, I'm thinking about changing out my water heater. I'd say, Mom, no, 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 stop. No, call somebody. Yeah, Yeah, step away from the water heater. Please Get the warranty. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, whatever you got to do, Mom, please step away. (laughs) But Jeff, if you called and said, Roger, I'm thinking about changing out my water heater. What do you think? I said, dude, go for it. Give me a call if you need anything. Yeah. Your capabilities are a lot different than hers. I understand her. I appreciate that. It's, you're making me tingle inside. You, yeah. you, you know, but, 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 but I mean, seriously, I've, I've seen what you do. Could you handle it? Absolutely. May you run into something where, man, I got a question. I'm not sure what to do about this. Part oh, here. sure. I got to Google once in a while. or got to call you, an old trade friend or something, right? No, yeah, we all do. We all yeah, do. It's part of the learning curve. So, you know, yes, anybody can legally do anything to their plumbing system. Like we talked okay, about. Okay, now we're talking Texas now, right? Like if you yeah, join yeah, us late, yeah, you missed the whole. There you go. You missed the whole. In Texas, <laughs> if it's your homestead, you can do anything on yes, permit. Yeah, there you go. It's so, same so, in Ontario. In Ontario, we can do anything on permit. Good. So Ontario, Canada, and Texas are very much the same, um, which is fascinating. Anyway, let's get to Gotham's question. I don't know. It was on the screen for a little yeah, while. No, no, now I, it's gone. He, so he was, he's wanting to change out a radiator. Here's my thing. Oh, okay. Gotham, as, as long as you can turn off the water. You can disconnect the radiator. You can look at the connections and see if they're close to the same. Maybe they're exactly the same. Probably not. If not, can you reroute those water lines to get them to where the new connections are? Changing out a radiator is really easy. It's like changing out a water heater. Mm. Where is the water inlet? Where is the water outlet? And what kind of connections are they? Can you alter the pipe to that connection if need be? Right. Handled that pretty good, didn't I? Not bad. Kind of like I know a little bit about plumbing. You, here you might something. be a plumber or something. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I got books. I got good books. You got books. You know, yeah. I was on a job once. It was rather interesting. It was an older house in Ottawa, uh, 1920. And it had a hot water heating system, still radiators through the whole house. Um, 
and we were doing the bathroom and they wanted to add a hot water radiator towel warmer in the room. And so they bought it from Europe and they have different plumbing there. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Uh, it wasn't that tricky. Just had to make a couple of calls by a couple of adjustment fittings. And next thing you know, boom, I was putting in a European hot water towel rack system in a North American home in a, in a market where we barely have any hot water radiators at all. And it's not that hard. Really, it's just about knowing when to turn the water off before you open up a line. <laughs> Isn't that the biggest thing? Or even if it's if you're working on a toilet, know where to turn the water off outside in case the valve breaks, in case something happens. Right. That's one of the biggest tips that will save everybody headache and a lot of money. But here's the cool thing. Jeff, I just did a video the other day where an eye in here about a combi boiler. Mm. And it's like, I want radiant heat under my floors in my bathroom now. I've wow. we've never done it, but man, the water heater, the, the boiler. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it easy. So yeah, we can do anything. That's what I try to tell people. If you can look at it and say, hey, I want this. I want a towel warmer from Europe in my bathroom. Hmm. Man, we can find a way to hook it up. It's not hard to do. No, it's just mechanical. It's all about it's all about um, thread size, ID, OD, and and how to make that conversion, right? Because there's a couple of differences there. Okay, Jason's got a question here. And guys, if you're just joining the stream, uh, I'm here with Roger Wakefield, uh, master plumber, YouTuber from Texas. We're just going to go through and answering questions, sharing our experiences. I'm from a northern climate up in Canada. He's down in Texas. We all got different rules and different materials. We just thought, what a great opportunity to like share some experience and just like huh, download into your brains to give you some confidence to handle your own plumbing projects. And uh, Jason's got a question here is, if I have an existing laundry drain, one and a half inch, which is vented down the line. Can I add a laundry sink 10 feet away to the laundry drain or let's siphon the P-trap? Yeah, you ever have to read these questions and draw it on your brain at the same time? <laughs> yeah, and, and luckily you had it up there before you started talking about it, so I've had time to think about it. Good for you. <laughs> Number one, the, the inch and a half drain, I, I don't like that. No, it's uh, not big enough for wet venting, is it? No, it's not. And even... You know, here in Texas, we run two inch up to the washing machine box. Yep. Uh, when did you guys change that code, Roger? Oh, God. Uh, I think I was doing that back in the 80s. Really? We just changed that in Canada like three years ago. Did you? Yeah, uh, two inch and, to the water, to the drain, for the washer. And, and then again, that may have been the plumbers that originally taught me. Mm. You know, because now that I'm thinking about it, I think the code was inch and a half because I always asked why they did that. Mm. The other one I don't understand is why a tub drain can be inch and a half, but a shower drain has to be two inch. Isn't that nutty? We're putting the same tub and shower valve in. Yep. yep. And even on the tub that has the inch and a half drain, you don't have to go through the shower head. You can open up the tub spout, which just pours water in it. But That's that one funny. can get the smaller drain. So, yeah. So in, in Canada, we have one and a half to both. But then we oh. have to put in an adapter to hit the two inch at the because the fixture is made for the American plumbing. Company. You bet. You bet. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. I I would not add if you've got an existing laundry drain line. Okay, so so it's not necessarily a washing machine laundry mm. drain, which is vented down the line. Can I add a laundry sink ten feet away? If you're not, you can probably do it and not have a problem with it with the vent further down. I think you're going to get too far away from your vent, I think it's yeah. going to cause you problems and it could cause you, cause you to soften out the P trap on the other one. My, my thing here is if you're moving a laundry sink 10 feet away, that's at the extent of your clean out length. Like we, we have 12 foot clean outs on these mm -hmm. lines. And if you're moving your laundry sink that far away, is it your intent to drain your washing machine into that laundry tub? Because if it is, then maybe you really need to consider upgrading to two inch and get to that wet vent line. Because it's like, if you can see it and it's like, then just upgrade it. Follow it back to where it joins up with yeah. the drain and, and update change out the your, sun or whatever. Yeah, update to two inch. And, and look, though, he's not just talking about moving it, he's adding another yeah. laundry sink. So now right? you got two sinks on there. You, it may be smart to go ahead and come up to two inch. If you can even add a relief vent further in, go back and tie it in, 
that, that could save you some problems too. Here's one of the crazy things, because here we are giving you advice, and obviously you're not doing it on permit, or you'd already been told by the permit officer when you're pulling <laughs> it that you've done it wrong. So <laughs> well, listen, not- when it when in doubt, all right, just oversize it. Yeah. That, that There's helps never a, lot. a problem with going bigger. It yeah. All right. So yes. if you're if the question is, eh, is it gonna handle it? Eh. It's like, you know what? Sometimes you need a V8, not a V6. So just update the pipe and go bigger. And you won't have to worry about it because a two-inch water line can handle anything in the house except a toilet. Done. Drop the mic. Like, I don't know. There we go. Uh, I love it. I love it. Mc, McMitties. That's a great name. It makes me hungry. I don't know why. Uh, 60 split foyer, Maryland. Okay. Main water spindle valve is leaking at the stem nut. Can I shut off at the curb and replace the innards with a new valve instead of desoldering? Possibly so. The first thing is, <laughs> if it's just a packing nut leaking, have you tried just tightening up just a little bit? Mm. A lot of times that can happen. And I don't mean just crank down on it, but I mean, as long as your valve's open and does the valve work, have you serviced it lately? Will it open and close? Will it shut off water to the house like it's supposed to? If it does, what I'd like to do is open it up, turn it about one full turn closed, take a wrench, tighten that packing nut just a little bit. Hmm. Now, if you can shut off water prior to it, prior to it, you can possibly undo that nut and replace the packing inside of it. That keeps you from having to solder in a new valve. So are we talking here about, um, because there's a couple of different valves in my mind. One of them, they have gaskets, right? Mm -hmm. And and when open and close, there's two different gaskets. And sometimes these valves, they're open for so long that the other side of the, they just start to leak, right? (laughs) They're just, they're not going to make it. They're not a quarter turn ball valve. There's a lot of old valves out there that have got gaskets that need to be replaced. Is that what this is we're talking about? They're calling it a spindle valve. I'm assuming this is either a gate valve or globe valve, something like that. So you guys are all talking plumber talk now. So you've lost me. <laughs> is this is right at the water main going into the house? Uh, well, that's what they're saying. Uh, the main okay. water valve. So I'm assuming it's the one by the house, not at the meter. Because the one at the okay. meter's on their side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, there you go. Maybe. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, at least if it's, you got the ability to turn off the water at the, at the, at the, at the road, right. You can depressurize your line and you can take things apart and you're going to replace whatever needs to be replaced. So, so that's so, a benefit. Jeff, before you get in this question, let me ask you that y'all's meters are out by the road. I'm assuming like ours are here in Texas. Not a damn chance. No. Where's y'all's no. meters in the house? Uh, they, we run our water lines at least five feet below ground. <laughs> okay. Because our frost line is 48 inches. I get it. Uh, I get and it. so it comes in underneath our basement slab. Wow. And then we have a, a main shutoff valve in the basement. And then we have a water meeting, or like, a, like, a, like a meter. And then we have another shutoff valve in most cases above that. And um, yeah. So when we want to turn off the water, what we do is we go to our basement and mm-hmm. we go to the wall of the home that's closest to the street. And then we just... Look around for wherever that valve is. <laughs> I, I love it. I, th- I think that's fantastic. When I was down here in Florida and I had to do some plumbing work here, I opened up the little green box in the yard and all there was is mud. And I'm thinking to myself, how many years has it been since someone's turned this valve off? Yes. And I don't know what it looks like in there. So I called the city up and said, hey, you guys want to come and clean this out because I got to turn off my water and I'm afraid I'm going to wreck something. And sure enough, there were there were all kinds of loose wires and control mechanisms and it just stuck in the dirt. And these guys, they knew what they were doing. They cleaned it all out. And I was like, wow, that is ridiculous. And he goes, well, every time it rains, it just washes it right back in here. And I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. Anyway. <laughs> That's pretty why, good. Why do I feel like I missed a question? Uh <laughs> Okay. Uh, Slack. I got a toilet that rocks back and forth. Oh, well, you got more problems than you know about right there. And a slow flush. Would this be because of air getting into the system from the toilet flange? No. no. The more <laughs> no. air you have in your system, the better it flushes. So that's a no. 
If it's rocking back and forth and it's a slow flush, I'll guarantee you it's a toilet install issue. Somebody didn't know how to install your toilet and they squeezed wax in the in, in the wrong spot. Or it could just be a really cheap toilet with a really good brand name on it. Or, or even <sighs> that, the flange itself. The yeah. flange itself could be old. There could be a leak. The, it could have maybe not been installed properly and water got out around that wax ring. Now right. the, the, the ring around it, the metal ring, is rotted and corroded. Yeah, you, you need to pull your toilet or have a plumber do it. Entirely up to you. There are so many places that you can have a restriction in the flow of water on a drain. Mm -hmm. If your house is before 1975 in Florida, you probably have a cast, cast plumbing. Now, most people understand that cast plumbing is not a solid pipe. It's a sectional pipe, and there's wide ends and narrow ends, and they just stick them together, sort of. All okay. right? So in cast iron plumbing, <laughs> ca okay, cast iron yeah. plumbing is all across the United States. Okay, so this isn't just a Florida thing. This, not, is, no, this, it, was, it, this was standard for a long time. You bet. And, and when and they the, brought in building code in 74, 75, and they changed it, and they said, hey, everybody's got to go to something more modern, right? Oh, no. I, when I started plumbing in the 80s, we were still using cast iron here in Garland. No kidding. Oh, wow. yeah. And, and okay. it's funny, Jeff, because that's one of the first things I remember from being in this particular job, and I was still an apprentice. I remember the inspector saying, Garland will never go to PVC. Because it's unproven, it's untested, and we know cast iron will last forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? Forever does not hold the true. So here's the deal. Yeah. The wonderful thing about cast iron is like every joint is kind of sealed. And as water runs through and things corrode, it seals up. <laughs> that's that's how that works. But if you got a tree anywhere in your vicinity. Those roots are looking for water supply and they're going to find their way through that joint. And they're going to go from a one thick, one inch thick root down to a nanometer and then show up in your pipe and go back to one inch again and grow a tree of roots right there on your water pipe. And that's how they're going to operate. And so you could have a problem with your toilet. That's not your toilet. It's not your plumbing. It's not your extensions. It's it's not the plumbing in the house. It's not the plumbing under the slab. It's the plumbing from the slab to the street. At the end of the day, the toilet moves a lot of water real quickly. The only other thing in the house that moves water that fast is your washing machine. So if, if that's having problems backing up as well, then maybe you should take a look down the line and get somebody in there with a camera and inspect it. But um, if your washing machine is working fine and your toilet's slow... Yeah, it's probably a toilet problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, indeed. David has a question here. Uh, now, how have the advances in tankless water heaters changed, and are they now worth it over the classic tanks? Worth it, I mean, as far as the investment, I imagine. I know, my answer. T tell me what you think. Well, I remember when they first came out, um, and in we anytime we installed them too close to the fixture, we had problems making hot water. There was There was something about the flow rate with proximity to the tank that we had issues with here in Canada. Hmm. I know it's, it's fascinating, but we, we, we couldn't understand it. But every time we had a, a, a one of these like on-demand water, water heaters that was within six feet of a bathroom, the shower never got hot. It would just switch back to cold all the time on a regular basis. And there's probably a sensor issue in there. Um, so we just learned as renovators to move them further away. I, for whatever reason, it worked. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and for whatever reason, I hated them because of that, because <laughs> I could not deliver a consistent result, right? And so I steered clear of them for a long time. Well, here's my experience. And I think that they are getting better. I think they're getting a lot better, to be honest, mm. because number one, as long as your plumber or you, if you're doing it yourself, does a gas load calculation chart, meaning you know how many BTUs your systems are using, you know everything you need to know about your system and make sure your current gas system can handle the load of a tankless. A tankless water heater has to be 199,000 BTUs or lower. Once it goes over 200,000, it's a boiler. Yes. Whole different set of rules. Mm -hmm. A normal tank top water heater is 40 to 50,000, really 30 to 50,000 BTUs, depending on the size of it. So think about this. You're going from a 50,000 BTUs to almost 200,000 BTUs. Most gas meters aren't regulated or big enough to carry that much gas. Hmm. 
depending on what you've got installed. So the first thing you need to make sure is you need to do a gas load calculation chart to make sure you've got a big enough gas line from where it comes in at your meter through your house to where the tankless heater is going to go. Start with that. The vents are getting easier. You can now vent most tankless water heaters in PVC or Centrotherm, which is a product that has a metal lining in it. Mm -hmm. so a lot of different things you can do, but yeah, I think that they are. The advances are phenomenal. I spoke at KBiz about these new tankless heaters that have memory, so they're learning your usage habits. They put a comfort fitting in at the furthest point. It can circulate water to make sure you have hot water circulating in your line before you ever get that's, in your That's job. a really big issue, too. Right it really there. is. Yeah, really is. Having circulation in a line like that, it makes all the difference. And mm -hmm. I think that's where we're running into problems because, uh, let's just face it, I mean, um, in Canada, we were using flow restriction, everything in a bathroom. And so the water's hardly even moving. <laughs> and so the tank is going, am I on? Am I off? I don't know. I'm confused. It's having an identity crisis really mm -hmm. is what it was. <laughs> so by having that, having that flow, um, you know, like recirculation system yep. kept the water moving. So it kept the tank on. And I think that ended up being the solution. The only other thing I'll say about these tankless systems is this, um, my advice from my gas guy last year, and this has probably changed because, you know, the world's gotten more normal, is don't put in a tankless system because there are so many different systems and so many different parts and no one's keeping parts in stock. So when it fails, it takes weeks, if not months, to get replacement parts because everybody is trying to get into this game and they're always changing their specs and they're not keeping stock on parts for repairs. And so I thought that was really interesting insight coming from a gas tech. Um, it, are things more normalized? Are they more standard now? Like you can't put a Chevy engine into a Ford. I get it. But you like, you know, at least if, if you've got an issue with most plumbing, you can go down to your local building store and you can pick up a fitting. Is, is What's it like out there, Roger? It, it's getting better. Uh, you know, we went through the big freeze that made it all the way down to Texas a couple of years ago. And at that point, you couldn't <laughs> yeah. get parts for anything. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. You bet. Yeah, yeah. We, we tried to send it all up to y'all. <laughs> but we're like, we're like, why did those daggum Canadians send all their cold weather down here to us? Well, you know what? I, I, I apologize about that. Um, I remember back when that happened, we actually did live shows every day for a week, uh, teaching people how to solve their problems and, and, and to deal with the flooding and the bus pipes and everything else. And, and, uh, that was a really interesting time, and it really opened my eyes to how, how different the construction technology is in different geographical zones based on past weather events mm -hmm. and how much, you know, a little bit of thought moving forward about weather events needs to be incorporated in the way we're building. Well, you know, talking about that, do y'all ever put tank top water heaters in your attics? No, 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 no. We don't even use the garage. We can't. We can't. It's not not happening. Um, you know, in, in the in the scale of, of temperature, we operate basically where zero is freezing, okay, and 36 is melting. All right. And minus 36 is kind of like February. And <laughs> when it's minus 36 in the United States, it's minus 36 in Canada. That's where we meet. Other than that, we have completely different numbers. So when I tell people that we get to minus 36, they just go, why in the hell do you live there? And <laughs> the answer is, well, it was somebody else's plan. I was just born there and now I'm <laughs> stuck paying taxes. Anyway, um, we are well over our hour here, my friend. I don't want to keep you for too much longer. I know we agreed to an hour show, but uh, let's just answer one more quick question. And I'm then we can brother. wrap this up, guys. Um, is the crimping tool for copper lines just as secure as soldering? What tool is best? Is there a crimping tool for copper? Well, uh, I'm assuming that she means either for pro press, you know, cause, cause they've, they've got the crimp fittings now. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the only one that I can think of. Is it just as secure as soldering? No. Uh, we, we've actually got, we built a blast chamber out here so we can, I, can, I mean, I can, I've got a 10,000 PSI hydrostatic pump so we mm -hmm. can blow stuff up and, and I love it. That's it's, fun. It, it's all plumbing. Yeah. So we stick pops in, <laughs> pump it up and, and see what happens. And we did this because of a sponsor. Uh, yeah. we, we wanted to test their product, make sure it held like they said. Yep. Nice. Look, it, it, PEX, 
crimp, none of it. Push to connect, PEX, any of it. It doesn't hold like solder. Uh, we have no, we cannot even get a solder joint to blow apart, even up to 10,000 PSI. So right. it, it's the, the copper will blow a hole in it. The cap on the end, anything will blow apart except for the solder joint. So is it as strong as? No, nothing's ever going to be. Doesn't need to be that strong it doesn't. in most it doesn't. situations, right? That's the other question, though. Like it, it, uh, it doesn't. Yeah, when 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 we come down to it, people want to know what's the best, mm -hmm. right? And the answer is, well, um, how good are you at soldering? And if you're not any good at soldering, then a good solid ring crimp tool for PEX is good. Mm -hmm expansion PEX tool for a, another couple hundred bucks is better. CPVC water supply lines is, is still great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, there's really no wrong answer. There's just different options, right? We're really talking Ford, Chevy, um, Dodge or, or GMC, like pick a truck. Like it really, as long as you, Install your plumbing with integrity because it all comes down to the installer, right? Then you're going to be fine with either of those options. They're all rated for a 50-year build. The question is, what's going to last longer at the end of the 50 years? And my answer always is sell the house after 45 and don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and hey, pull a permit and get it inspected, and you know you as did it right. As, as long as somebody else says, hey, this is what needs to happen, then who really cares? All right. My goodness. Roger, thanks a lot for coming on the show tonight. I think we're going to have to come have you come back because we got a ton of questions. Uh, number I know one, Jeff, I, this is I missed one from Steve. And, you know, Steve, I'm sorry I missed your question, dude. I can't find it now. No, no I, is... I found it just a second ago because I did. I kept scrolling up while, while you were reading you? something else. Yeah, and, and let me see if I can find it. He's he's building a slab, and he put four inches. Of, there you go, right there. That's there it. we go. Got to talk to Steve. He's been a member for a long time. No, oh, no, that's why I found the question. All right. Thank you. He's got an 11 by 17 hole that he dug down and put four inches through quarter rock, compacted it down. I'm not poured slab yet, but this hole just fills with water. <laughs> yeah, that's not really a plumbing question. It's not. The only thing you might be able to do is build like a sump pit area. Yeah. To where any water there has a place to go, and then you can pump that water to somewhere else. Really, at the end of the day, that's what it is. If you have groundwater underneath your slab, the only way to solve it is to dig a deeper hole and put a pump lower than the water line. And then it should evacuate that water to the point where you can, you can move forward comfortably. Now I know houses that are out here in Ontario, we get this all the time. And those, some of those sump pits, they, they're running three or four hours a day. All right. Like it's not abnormal, but that's because they are fighting a battle that's so far down from anything that's affecting your house that is worth it. And, you know, it's kind of like um, if, if the pump was another foot higher, it might only run 10 minutes every day, but we try to get as extreme with our approach to dealing with water in a foundation as we can, because water is not your friend underneath your house. <laughs> and that's just the way we work it. So yeah, if you have a one sump and it's working too hard, put in a second, all right. And then put in backup pumps in each of those lines as well. And uh, whatever it takes, because at the end of the day, two sump pumps with a backup pump in each of them in a house is still only going to cost you a thousand bucks. What's a thousand bucks? And can Consid save you a considering, fortune. considering the alternative, right? It's yes. just, it's not even a question, right? It's, it's, it's why we give the boys in blue bulletproof vest because it's just worth it, even though they're expensive. All right. Um, you know, we, one question I want to ask before we're done. You bet. And this is the big debate. Copper versus plastic. I hear this comment all the time in my because I'm a big PEX fan because I'm an idiot when it comes to plumbing. So, you know, I, I love the convenience. Um, is there any truth to this rumor that the PEX is like toxic to the human being versus copper versus anything else? Is that something that your industry really pays attention to? I, I don't think most of us do. California's outlawed some pecs because they're like, look, it, it leaches chemicals into the water. Okay. I don't know if y'all know this. There's chemicals in the water anyway. 
Uh, yeah, last time I checked. Yeah, you no, know, yeah. there's a there's a bunch of chemicals in the water. Yeah, yeah. Are the chemicals there's a little heroin, in it? there's a little crack, there's it, a little it, bit it, of this yeah. and that. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and, and everybody in the United States that, that there's what, what's that? there's a website ewg.org something like that. Okay. They can literally just go and put their zip code in. Yeah. And it will tell them all the contaminants in their water that are uh, well. First of all, it'll tell you all the contaminants in your water. Yes. Then you can scroll down a little bit further. It'll tell you all the contaminants in your water that are above the recommended levels. Yes. One of the biggest ones that always come up is arsenic. Okay. Now, arsenic. Yeah, well, so, yeah, don't want yeah, some yeah, of that. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, that, that's up. On, that's <laughs> high up on the list of things you don't want in your water. Right. And right. my thing is, yeah. look, if that's allowed in the water from the city, what can the plastic pot be putting in if it's any worse than that? Well, you know, I'm always thinking of if if water quality is a concern, then get yourself a purification system underneath your drinking water supply in your sink. Well, and, you know? and I'm gonna I'm gonna take it further, Jeff. Yep. If you if your water is really that big of a problem, put in a whole house water filtration system. Yep. yep. Because your body absorbs those same chemicals when you're even in the shower. Yep. When that water runs on you, your body sucks the chlorine and magnesium and calcium and everything right out of it before that water ever hits the drain. Yep. If water quality is really a problem to you and you're really worried about the water you're putting in your mouth, be worried about the same water you bathe in and think about a whole house water filtration system. At the end of the day, it's a $10,000 solution. Yeah. And you well, can you can have you can zero parts per million that. water if you want it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Uh, move on. Because then you're going to just go out into the world. You're going to get in your car, drive down the street. And when's the last time you cherish the air filter on the intake on your car? Like, <laughs> like there's so many places to get toxins. Listen, folks, at the end of the day, uh, nobody lives forever. So let's not make mountains out of molehills. But if you are concerned about water quality, you can fix it. And uh, if you're concerned about learning how to do plumbing, um, you can watch my videos. And uh, at the end of the day, you should probably watch some of Rogers, too, because he knows <laughs> what he's doing. Um Roger, thank you so much for coming on today, buddy. I really appreciate it. This Brother, has been great. Oh, God, I've loved this. And you get to come down and come into my channel in October. So this is going to be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually be in Texas. I'm going to hang out at Roger. And we're going to do – you have a thing on your channel. You yeah, like What is that, a whiskey room or something you got going on over there? Well, it's the shop. You know, on the other okay. side of this wall is my shop. That's where we've got the workbenches and we can get in there and do things. Uh-huh. But we've also got a big browning gun safe <laughs> okay. full of tequila and bourbon. Bourbon. Oh, a okay. Bourbon. See, I'm not a bourbon guy. I'm from Canada. Oh, we do oh, whiskey, but I'm going to maybe have to dabble a little bit and we'll have There's some fun. A, there might be some whiskey in there too. Yeah, but, yeah, but, we'll but see. We, we call it sipping Saturdays. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to come down. We're going to get to try some stuff. We're going to do some sipping and we're going to, we're going to talk whatever we want to talk because it's your channel and I'm your guest. So, you know. The floor will be yours. We'll be talking a lot of DIY, so it'll be good. Fantastic. Guys, if you're out there watching the video in your community, uh, do me a favor before we leave tonight. Just hit, give a quick thumbs up on this video if you like this kind of content. And let us know in the comment section. Hey, should we get more guests? Should we bring Roger back? And the answer to that is yes, obviously, because we, we just scratched the surface today. We could do another hour or two of plumbing questions, I'm sure. Um, and we'll, we'll organize some more stuff because I know, like, it is getting really difficult out there to hire somebody to do work in your house. And I get it. And it's not going to get any better. Um, half of the houses in this country are built from almost 50 years ago or older. And uh, you know what? Trades people are going where the money is. So that means the average homeowner who's got an old house is up Creek without a paddle. And it's just the way she goes. So did I just say that? Oh my goodness. Look at me go. Um, it was on point. It's a plumbing thing. <laughs> if you need help, uh, you're your best contractor in a lot of cases. All right. And so I'm here to help you. Um, we'll do whatever we can to help you get through whatever storm you're dealing with. All right. Roger, thanks again. Uh, we're going to just call that a night. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. If we didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry. If you're a member of our channel, then hit us up in our member forum. If you're not a member of the channel, consider joining membership because membership has its privileges. Cheers till next time. And again, Roger, thanks for coming tonight, buddy. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Jeff. Good night, everybody.